So good evening and welcome to the ZWAC show. ZWAC stands for the Zero Waste Advocacy Committee of the Northern California Recycling Association, which we shortened to call NICRA. I'm your host, John Moore. In tonight's show, we feature for the very first time an important part of zero waste that is one of the most satisfying and easiest areas to practice, recovering surplus food to help those in need, which sounds simple. Unlike trying to target plastic waste, where the petrochemical industry looms large in the way, surplus food recovery has a really great advocacy advantage, and that is no one, absolutely no one, supports wasting food, except maybe for those employed to haul it to the landfill. But with only those people opposing it, really the path is wide open to getting involved and making a difference. And the challenges to, for food recovery are really more about logistics than on policy. So tonight we feature our guest is David Hott, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Lowe's and Fishes Family Kitchen in San Jose. David also serves on the NICRA Board of Directors and he's the first sitting director to appear on our show. For people who have been in, attending in other weeks, you might be wondering what's happened to the recycling archives. Uh, they took a pause for the summer, but next month is gonna, they will be back with a feature of a zero waste superhero from the generation younger than me, which is to say most people, Laura Anthony, who is the president of Zero Waste San Diego. But with only one interview tonight, I'm hoping I can take David into a deep dive about how we can stop wasting food when so many people in the world are going hungry. David? Yes. Before we get to the loaves and fishes, um, can you tell us how, how you, what path you took to, to get to where you are? <laughs> yes, I'd be happy to. Um, let's see, I grew up in Cupertino. Um, I'm a Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area um, native, and now I'm back home. Um, I You'll notice that when I speak, I seem to have picked up a New England slash Canadian accent. I am <laughs> French Canadian. However, living back east for 18 years, I picked up some type of way of saying house a little differently. So <laughs> anywho, I grew up in Cupertino, high school here. I moved to uh, the Washington DC area when I was 25 to raise my children. I have four kids. Um, took a, uh, put my kids through college and then went back to school myself and finished a couple of degrees and stayed in the uh, state of Maryland, working uh, up and down from uh, Rhode Island down to Florida. And I was there for 18 years, as I said. I came back to California about 12 years ago, and I've been in California since then. Um, that said, I got into this space really through a program that a dear friend of mine, Dr. Nancy Fishman, created. Dr. Nancy Fishman is the founder of the largest uh, food recovery, grocery food recovery uh, organization in the United States, actually. She started that from her group. Uh, and now it is just this massive behemoth. She came out to California. She retired from uh, Michigan, which normally it's the normal, it's normally the opposite, right? They retire and move to Michigan. She retired and moved to California. Called me about this initiative that she had baking in the oven at uh, an organization here that's local. And if you know Nancy, you do what she says. And I did. And I jumped into the food <laughs> recovery space. And uh, I've, I've been, I caught the bug. Uh, you know, I, I'm a hippie with short hair. And I love that I can help to take food that would otherwise be put into the landfill and use it to feed people. Uh, she created a model that we use refrigerated vehicles to pick up and then also deliver to the communities that we serve. So I came into this after a, you know, a career in for-profit. You know, I took about four years and hiked the Sierra Nevada mountains and decided it was time for a small company that I started and closed. And you know, spent four years, I hiked uh, 2,100 miles of the mountains. And uh, so I'm, a, I'm also a dirt bag as we call ourselves. Uh, I'm a backcountry wilderness guide. I'm a woofer certified in uh, a specific type of first aid to keep somebody alive with duct tape like MacGyver. Um, and uh, I get to 
lead groups uh, on adventures and, and out in the middle of nowhere, where that's all, honestly my favorite place to be. Um, at Loaves and Fishes, I came aboard this organization in 2019, and uh, through that a la carte, what was a startup into a folding into another nonprofit, and I've been going at it ever since, um, and became the well, CEO of the organization since May. Well, that's that's quite a path. What what exactly does Lowe's and Fish's Family Kitchen do? We provide meals to the community that we serve. So we have a commercial kitchen where we prepare meals, and we also have our food recovery program. It's been around for about 40, well, 43 years. Started out in the San Francisco Bay Area. And again, we take ingredients that we receive through Second Harvest of Silicon Valley and ingredients that we purchase ourselves create meals, and then distribute those meals out to the communities that we serve. We serve about 155 agencies throughout Santa Clara and San Mateo County. Um, we use refrigerated and, and you know, temperature-controlled vehicles to do that work, 21 staff, uh, and we were able to provide 1.8 million meals last year uh, completing that effort. So we stay pretty busy. I guess so. That's pretty satisfying. So when, yeah. when, if if you Google Lowe's and Fishes, you find there's other similarly named organizations yeah. in different yeah. places. Is it one yeah. big group with like franchises or regions or? Great question. And the answer is no. Um, the name is trademarked, patented by an individual that started way quite some time ago that made an agreement with other agencies that use the name that if you do the same type of work that our companies do, go ahead and use the name, right? And so we're all mission driven and do similar work. However, we're not connected. It's not an umbrella. We're all separate entities, all separate 501Cs, autonomously working in the environment. That, that's an interesting business model. So that someone owns the trademark to the name, but you can license the use of the name if you're doing similar work. Now, do you do you have to subscribe to some kind of constitution? No, no? not at all. He's a very kind individual. And uh, no, we don't have to pay for it. It's just something that he wanted to put his name on, and I won't say his name. Um, however, um, it's a it's a wonderful story. You know, um, we're a non-denominal non-denominational organization that has a name that's very uh, familiar to those who may know the pro the the the, uh, the parable and uh, and you know I get to feed people uh, and then also at the same time feeding people I get to recover food that would turn to you know greenhouse gases that's killing our mother so um, it's really been a fun experience so to answer your question more more specifically no we're we get to use this name and we're grateful that we can. And, and there, there's no limitations on what you do when you're using the name? That's what I was getting at. No, no, we haven't found, I think, I, I think if, well, I think there's limitations of everything. And as an attorney, I'm sure you can agree that if we went too far off the beaten path of, of doing something that wasn't mission driven, that we may be asked to correct our behavior. However, in this case, I know that we won't do that, at least on my watch. Yeah, I, I you're right. I, it was sort of tapping into my lawyerly, you know, trademark licensing control over the... Absolutely. Okay, well, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of, in a sense, like a light hand. Yes, uh, very much so, and more grateful. And unfortunately, it, the, the other organizations that have the same name uh, do similar work. Um, mm -hmm. And so I have found in my experience doing this work that we all come from a spirit of being helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and and I'm very, very grateful that that's the case. Well, it comes from a spiritual start. It does, it does come from the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't it? Yeah, the name, for sure, for sure. Started in a Catholic church with a number of people with a few uh, items of protein and bread and, and some salad and some fruit. And it's been able to expand from one serving site to 1.8 million meals a year. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful organization that I'm very proud to be part of. I, I can imagine I'd be proud of that too. And I'm gonna to get to the how, 
how you get to the 1.8 million in a second. We, we've we had discussion yeah. on the show in the past about this particular parable and the, the, the ending line of it, which is let there be no waste, which seems like exactly what we're talking about, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I think that as we have the conversation in many of the spaces that I get involved with said conversation, education about how to resolve in the front end, not purchasing so much at the grocery store and managing dietary uh, restrictions a little differently and having less. You know, in Europe, they have small cold boxes. In the United States, we have these massive refrigerators that we fill up every time we go to the grocery store. And in many cases, if we look at the waste that's generated because our eyes are being challenged by the marketing plans that are out there in the world to buy more, buy more, buy more, um, it makes it more difficult for people to approach that solution in a more mindful way. Unfortunately, well, we've, we've made we've, we've really done, I believe, a good service to provide food generators uh, a way to not only get a tax incentive tax break, but also that we can use those ingredients to uh, ingredients. So ingredients that can be used within our meals and prepared meals that we can pick up and then deliver to the communities that we serve. So I'm glad you touched on the, the, the surplus part because in, in this little zero waste field, we, we, we try to uh, ascribe to four R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, rot and reduces, reduces at the top of the pillar. But yeah. when you're talking about surplus, you're almost talking about a need to reduce. So is loaves and fishes in the reduce business or the reuse business? I would say, you know, it's a little bit of both because we do have a commercial kitchen and we're mindful about how we make purchases and also receive ingredients in, in, in our meals. Um, so we have to, because we're also a nonprofit that has a budget, right? right. We want to steward our donor do dollars appropriately. Um, reuse, um, it, we have a biodigester. So we use our biodigester to take all of the food scraps mm -hmm. and any items that come out of temperature because of, let's say, a refrigeration issue. We biodigest those materials. And within 24 to 36 hours, we have a very nutrient rich soil enhancer at the end of it, right? So, and another repurposing idea that we do is let's say you have a catering event that is a large plated event that you couldn't take those plates straight out to the communities that we serve. We actually repurpose those items, package them differently, and then distribute those, whether it be cold or hot, out to the two the two counties that we serve, and that's San Mateo and Santa Clara County. Well, can you explain that? Because you, I thought you said you're, you're, you're. These are plated meals, and you're you're repurposing them in some fashion. I didn't quite catch how you're doing that. So in the in the culinary world, in a catering situation, they use these large trays that okay. they plate, wrap. And then sometimes those don't get used because the event wasn't attended. Uh, maybe an event was canceled. So you'll have this large quantity of food, whether it be a protein, a veggie, a starch, a, uh, a fruit item, that's held back a house or in an area in a safe manner that we can use. But if you took that whole tray to John at the serving site, what would you do with that large amount of food, right? So what we do is we take that tray, we break it down, we package it in, in smaller portions so that we can distribute it out to those community partners that we have. And you do that in your commercial kitchen? Yes, both in the commercial kitchen and sometimes we use our refrigerated vehicle because we have a, a model that you can stand in. It looks like a walk-in refrigerator on wheels, really, um, that we have supplies to do that there as well. Each one of our team members is food handler certified through ServeSafe. So we practice food safety always. 43 years, our food has not caused anyone to be ill. And I just knocked on uh, this <laughs> is kind of wood, I think. Um, it's pressed wood. So, yeah, we'll say it's wood. Um, you know, it, so I don't want ever for someone who might suffer from already a compromised immune system to get ill from anything that we provide to them. So we're very, very careful about that. 
Right. It, it's not as simple as like picking it up one place and taking it to another place. There's there's a lot of safety issues that and logistical issues that happen along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and you know what? There are some that do it differently than we do. And I'm not knocking them. That's wonderful. I mean, recycling started with an idea and some tenacity and a focus on why are we tossing this into the landfill? Why aren't we recycling it, right? Yep. As it relates to food waste and food recovery, the same dynamic needs to occur to get the energy that came with recycling to also fall into how we reduce waste, food waste, and then also reuse food that could otherwise become waste. And I, and I think that's something that we're working very hard at trying to make sure that we do on a regular basis. And I bet it's hard. I, I want to get into a little bit of the how hard it is because for, yep. the, for the people on this, this Zoom, there's a lot of logistical challenges and there's a lot of places where people can get involved. But it, but I think a, a big picture look at, you know, how things get from one place to another is worth, worth, a, worth spending some time on. So conceptually, there's a lot of people with surplus food. There's groceries, there's caterers, there's hotels, yep. there's big events. Yeah. There, there's lots of supply of surplus food. How, how does it get captured in a, in a way that then can be, as you described, you know, put into smaller pieces and, you know, brought to, brought to the people that need it? Good question. And, and, and to answer that, it is a challenge. Right. We're we're one of the fortunate organizations that has 13 vehicles that are dedicated to the work. Right. Logistically, that food has to be handled appropriately as well. And there's a chain of custody that needs to be provided that I ask for. I want to know that the the food generator is handling that food in a food safe way. So MOUs need to be put in place. Site visits need to be done. And then once we're at the place where we're picking up food that's being generated by the food generator, we need to drive our vehicles to that location, pick up those items, temperature check them, and then transport those vehicles to the end user who's in one of our serving site lines. So the other area that you mentioned, grocery, we do pick up large quantities. Like we work with a vendor partner that we received 30 thousand pounds of grains and we receive between 30 and 60 thousand pounds of grains from this person or this entity that we use within our meals and we send it out throughout all of the bay area we have community partners that we work with that are also doing food recovery activities that can share it with their networks so logistically we truly have become a transportation organization in addition to a culinary organization we have a fleet of vehicles on the road every single day um, providing meals to the community um, from to back to and from to. So um, that said, John, I hope that helps bring light. You know, like with our prepared meal programs that we have agency partners with, the agency partner takes that excess food, drops the temperature to a safe temperature of 41 and below, we pick it up with our temperature controlled vehicle, which each vehicle is about $180,000 to purchase. We pick it up, it's at temp, that cold temp, we keep it at that temp, and then we take it same day to a serving site that we have established throughout Santa Clara and San Mateo County. So it's a lot of up and down the road. Um, it's a lot of from to, and yes, logistically, that has to be planned for. And, and I think we do a really good job of it. Does pretty much all recovered food need refrigeration, or are there are there exceptions to that? Well, if it it depends on the amount of time that it's out of either the oven or yeah. out of the refrigerator, right? So if it's at forty one degrees or lower, two hours or more, it needs it. My feeling, and and this is proven by statistical analysis, but two hours or more, it either needs to be eaten or put into refrigeration, right? If it's three to five days, after five days, it should be frozen or it needs to be put into compost or another alternative, animal feed or so on. Um, if it's if it's hot food, 135 degrees, 
if it drops below that and you're trying to cool it down, it needs to be cooled down to room temperature in two hours. And then in four hours after that two hours, it needs to be brought down to that 41 degrees or, or less. So the, the bacteria acts very uniquely as, as I'm sure some of you know. Um, so we're very careful about that. If the food that we receive is not at either the hot temperature and we can keep it at that temperature or at the cold temperature, and we use our vehicles to keep it at that cold temperature, we won't, we won't receive it, we won't accept it. So I think you said that the one one truck is a cost one hundred eighty thousand dollars, and you've got thirteen of them. Yeah, that, that's that's a pretty big barrier to entry the field. That's true, and that's why, you know, the grassroots is what started us on this path of food recovery. I've been fortunate to be involved since that first truck of all occurred. I was one person, one truck, right? Mm -hmm. And we've been we've been able to reach out and receive funding to fund the next truck and then the next truck and then the next truck right so it's a it's a it's truly an effort that you have to have your heart in um and i designed those vehicles myself based on the experience that i had doing food recovery myself right so the outlay is steep right it's quite steep however i didn't want to compromise food safety and we don't expand beyond our capacity. Um, there's so much food out there. There's so many other opportunities that we can participate in. However, if we're maxed out, we're maxed out until we get another vehicle. So if I were putting together a kind of org chart that yep. started at the top with the different places that you recover food from, which could be the groceries and the hotels and the events and a lot of different things, and then mm -hmm. it lands in your company's hands, and from there, it sounds like it goes through a lot of different hands before it gets to the people that actually need the food to eat it. What? How many? How many boxes are there on that org chart? Would you say? I would say from the food generator to the staff of that food generator to our team, from our team to the distribution site. That's Thank it. You. And then from the distribu distribution side to the people, 1.8 billion. Yeah, to the people. a lot of hands. That is absolutely correct. And each one of those hands, as they pass through hands, we temp check all those meals, temperature control check, because that's what we're required to do from a food safety perspective, right? So... If it's a kitchen item, so if it's one of those bulk items like a grocery recovery location, we could get raw ingredients. We could get uh, lettuce or we could get uh, produce of, of many types. That fresh produce could either be distributed directly to the communities that we serve at schools. You know, we do mobile markets where we provide meals and fresh produce throughout some of the Alum Rock School District schools here in San Jose. We could also take those raw ingredients back to our commercial kitchen and prep those, those items to save costs and create nutritious meals. So you could add a number of hands that touch those items, right? The, 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 the really cool thing is that we have figured out the steps that are necessary to get it from the food generator to what we refer to as our guest at our serving site or our guest at an organization that we provide meals to. And then they distri distribute that to the agency that they may be supporting clients that they have of their own. It sounds like an incredible amount of, of planning and logistics. And it's almost like you're planning an invasion. Are you the general here? <laughs> you know, the team, I give the credit to the team. I'm fortunate that, in fact, I have a team that I do that has, they have the heart that I, you know, I sometimes get teared up because I'm so grateful to this group of individuals that does the work every day. I don't want to say that I'm a general. I'm I'm a participant. I'm, I'm. I know I when I first encountered this subject, we, I was part of the NICRA team that put on the International Food Waste Forum. And I can't say I'm an expert in the field, but I was very impressed by how difficult all this is. And I know that I went into it thinking, as a lot of people do, 
Why isn't this simpler? Why, let's, let's pick on San Francisco for a second, because it's easy. They have a big convention center. People come there, they have lots of hot catered meals, and right outside that convention center are a lot of homeless people. Yep. Why is it so hard to feed the homeless? Hey, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about the Good Samaritan Act, right? Yeah. And the worry that companies have about liability. If I give you food and you get sick, then you're going to sue me. It comes back to that, right? So part of the messaging that we try to provide is that because you've donated your food to a nonprofit, you're protected by that act, right? So we'll take on that situation of, in fact, if you're worried about that liability, let us be the ones that help to provide those meals to the participant guests that might find, might find themselves in a situation where they're unhoused, right? Organizations, I think, make those choices because of a lack of education around the right and wrong thing to do for their own organization. There's just this worry, this litigious worry about that food going to the wrong, being used in a different way than they intended. And then it creates this atmosphere of, uh, uh, of fear that, in fact, uh, you find that people sometimes, not necessarily now as much as it used to be, they'd rather throw it in the, in the trash than to provide it to David that might be standing there needing a meal, right? So, John, it's, it's, it's a chicken and the egg type situation. I think the opportunity is, is that those that are on this call, those that are involved in food recovery, those that are involved in trying to reduce, um, just need to talk about it and be that bell and ring that bell about, you know, companies don't have to worry about the liability. Let's feed the individuals that are in need while at the same time, we're helping to reduce food waste in a country that no one, in a world that no one should go hungry. We have enough food to feed the entire population of the world. We choose to till some of that food in the ground because it's too difficult to harvest or there's not a market for it. Give it to me. I'll put it in meals, right? So I hope that helps to bring light to, you know, it, it comes back to individual companies' perspective around whether or not they're willing to be willing to be willing to help the cause of reducing food waste while helping to provide meals to those in need. Well, let's talk about the, the Good Samaritan Act for a second, because that's yeah. a lawyer thing. And if you want to pick on lawyers, it's okay. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> so, so 10 years or so ago, when I when I was first involved with this, the Good Samaritan Act, the federal Good Samaritan Act, and there's a California analog, were fairly recent creatures. The idea yes. was that if you're if you're giving nutritious food away, not adulterated food, if you're giving it away and you're not trying to make money on it and you're trying to feed someone who needs the food, that you're excused from liability. You're you're immune from liability. And that was pretty new 10 years ago, but it's not so new now. And I wonder, because you brought it up, if that's still sort of a vestigial problem with larger companies willing to participate in food donation. Because I'm thinking, let's say you're, let's pick on Twitter or Salesforce. You yeah. have a big convention in San Francisco. You have big hotshot lawyers who can tell you what the risks and exposures are. You have whole risk management departments and they're going to have to tell the decision maker, you're protected from liability. Right. If they're going to say it honestly. So why is there, do you think after 10 years and all these discussions, why there's still reluctance of companies to take a risk? To because, do right it's more, because it's more difficult to create a system that, that enables the food generator to provide those items to a food recovery organization than it is to make that compost and have the hauler take it away. It comes back to, for me, it comes back to convenience and we're a convenience driven society. If the kitchen staff isn't given the levity to make that connection with the food recovery organization, they can't set up a system that functions appropriately and, and in a case of a Salesforce or 
the other that you mentioned, uh, what'd you say, Twitter, um, which is, I guess, X now. You're right. They have events that there's this incredible opportunity to give those items to someone in need. We are finally getting closer and closer to feel, for people to feel more comfortable about that act. However, it's still, it's it goes back to people talking about the need for, for educating people around that liability not being such a concern. Why don't we switch it and say, you know what, this food could help feed X number of individuals versus this food could end up causing someone to be ill and then you're going to lose millions of dollars because of a lawsuit that in fact could incur, could incur your company this this maximum liability or this exposure. So I think it's societal. I, I don't think it's that we haven't tried to communicate that that's a protection that's in place. I just think that um, it, we're still we're still beating that drum and it's a really good question that's the, the answer is not simple. Um, well, uh, we've good moved a bit. That. We've moved a bit. However, there's still a long way to go. Well, there's a good and bad to it, and because I, I think of things as a, I have a lot of business experience in representing businesses, so I tend to think about things in a business way. One thing that your your organization does a little bit, without me, meaning this is a negative, you provide a halo. You you can be the recipient of the of the food and provide the immunity to the sales forces and Twitters. That's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. You've got a wonderful organ wonderful organization with an incredible outreach and a lot of dedicated people, which is a good thing. Yes. But if if the Twitters and the sales forces of the world can think, well, we'll just give it to someone who has 13 refrigerated trucks and let them worry about it. Somewhere along the way, you're missing stuff, aren't you? Because you're you're missing the smaller scale operations. Not everybody can afford yeah. 13 trucks, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and and it's a good point. And not everybody should be in the space. Um, some people need to recognize they may have, might have limitations to keep things safe. And so those are the conversations that need to happen in a candid way. I would love to be able to say that anyone can go and take their vehicle and pick up at Twitter with their truck or their vehicle to pick up the food that they're going to otherwise put in the landfill and be okay with picking it up without refrigeration or temp control. I'll never do that. Never have, never will, right? Because you're right. It's a, it's a complex answer, really, because you don't want to... I don't want anybody to feel like the big bad wolves in town. And because I've got 13 trucks, I'm going to take this all on and take all that could be available to you. That could very well happen if we handle this in an inappropriate way. I think there's space for all of us. I think that, you know, that act helps to protect people from liability. The people it's protecting is those for-profit agencies, and it's also protecting the nonprofit agencies. Not everybody knows that. Not everybody talks about that. And as people learn that fact, and they also recognize that, in fact, they could potentially have a tax deduction because of the donation to a 501c, those conversations become less cumbersome. And it depends on the audience you're speaking to. You know, if it's the accounting team, they're going to want to know one thing. If it's the marketing team, they're going to want to know another thing. If it's the executive team, they're going to want to know another thing or not know anything, right? So it's 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 complex. And the bigger the organization, the more complex it can become. My call to action is why do we need to make it so difficult? Yeah. Why can't we just work together? Why can't we just talk about real things and real solutions? And I think that's what we're, we're doing in the space. We're really working hard at who, who do you find is not willing to have a conversation these days? Well, I don't want to mention any one individual. You know, I think that there's opportunity with uh, universities feeling comfortable with food recovery. Um, I think there's some trepidation around people knowing how much waste actually comes out of those locations, right? Um, I think any food generator that... Um, 
doesn't feel comfortable with sharing how much waste they actually have would be would meet that criteria. Um, you know, we we I don't take on those battles. I, I don't. I I, I want to put in place an MOU that provides evidence that we do what we're going to do and that what we agree to do, and then get those food items to those who need it out of the country. And of course, like like you you've been saying, you're you're in a what I would call a regulated market because there's some there's important safety issues with this. Absolutely. So so I'm yeah. I'm wondering besides these legitimate safety issues which you you're 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 handling, are there other regulatory barriers that you encounter that really aren't quite reasonable or fair? Do you think? Well, I don't know as much about regulatory barriers as much as there are opportunities to talk about the real discussion around funding the activity. Mm -hmm. You know, making a line item on the county budget or the local jurisdiction or the state's budget that pays for SB 1383 activity. It's not there. We have a law that in fact is wonderful. It's an yeah. awesome law that was well thought out other than how to fund it. And so that I think is an opportunity. That's, that's an opportunity that we have to figure out how to sustain this activity that has mm -hmm. been happening since the beginning of even before SB 1383. So, I hope that helps to bring light or answer your question. It's again, it goes back to a complex issue, and I don't think there's one specific answer to that question. Yeah. Well, let let's go back. I want to again get a sense of the scope of the the, the handling of things. Yeah. There, there's this big this big net network that you have. Yep. Can can you kind of go through it piece by piece from from recovery to pantry to distribution? Sure, sure. So let's take one of those 30,000 pound tractor trailers that shows up here at the kitchen. What we do is before we receive that from this partner that we have, we reach out to a network of, of individual organizations that are also 501Cs that are involved in this activity as well. And we'll figure out dates and times that they could either pick it up or we can bring it to them along our route. Um, so there's a lot of admin to coordinate those activities. Then there's figuring out how much of that 30,000 pounds are we going to use in house that we store on site because we have two uh, shipping containers that have been retrofitted to become a refrigerator. One a refrigerator and one a freezer, 32 feet. You've seen shipping containers. We're fortunate that we have two of those. Um, do we send them out on our serving sites directly at our schools? You only have three to five days that that will be viable or it'll start to become a problem for you because it's some of it uh, will gradually start to be less likely used by human consumption, more likely to become fertilizer in our biodigester. So it's timing, it's capacity, it's space, and it's relationships. And from that initial agreement that we're going to receive that 30,000 pounds, it takes a full week to go from what we've received get to getting that 30,000 pounds either used in meals or out to our community partners throughout Santa Clara and San Mateo County. If it's prepared meals that we pick up, those go out same day. We pick them up today. We deliver them today in our distribution sites and our a la carte food recovery program distribution sites. If they're meals that we prepare in our kitchen, they also go out they're prepped, parts, portions are prepped like a protein item is prepped in advance. We keep it in our refrigeration, we reheat, build the meals, package the meals, send the meals, meals out either hot or cold. So to answer your question, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts. And um, at each step of the way, monitoring temperature and making sure that the items that we're sending to whomever it is is handled in a way that's appropriate and helps them to continue to deliver on their mission. So, John, I hope that helps provide an answer. Yeah, there, there's there's a lot of moving parts. I'm I'm wondering about diversity. Let's say yeah. you, you get a you get a call from a, a big bakery. They say we did an extra run. We've got ten thousand baguettes that we'd mm -hmm. like you to come get because we don't have any use for them. Yeah. What do you do with that so you're not stocking a pantry with 10,000 baguettes? 
you know, we we have a network that we share it with. You know, we 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 have a network that we share it with, and and we have serving sites. We serve a hundred and fifty more than 155, 163 different locations throughout Santa Clara and San Mateo County. Um, bread is a difficult one, right? There's a lot of things you can do with bread. However, there's only so much you can do with bread. So using your example, there are times when we have to say, I'm sorry, we can't take that much. Mm -hmm. We can take X. However, we know someone that might be able to take Y. And I think it's important that food recovery organizations do not overcommit because then that 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 wonderful goodwill is turned into what's going to just end up in the landfill anyway, right? So we then become the trash hauler, not the food yeah. recovery, right. right? So they're saving franchise fees by giving us what would otherwise be put into the landfill because of that potential, I'll air quoted, mistake that they made. Um, from a business perspective. But in a business perspective, you sort of have an unlimited supply of no cost goods. So the, some people would say, take it all in and figure it out. Yeah, we have to be more mindful because we're a nonprofit and we have limited resources. So if we know that 30,000 ton or 30,000 pound um, donation can go to good use without spoilage, we're going to take it. If we cannot, we're going to refer it. We're going to say, I'm sorry, John, we can take X. We cannot take Y. However, I know somebody that may be able to take Y. And I know somebody that may be able to take Z. Let me give you their name and maybe you can reach out to them. We can take this. So my vision of this is there's thousands of decisions that are being made to figure all this out on an, on an hourly, if not daily basis. That is correct. Who's making all those decisions or do you have some kind of software that's helping you make them? Well, we have a team. Um, our director of programs, Terry Ham, leads the charge along with Lauren Compatello, who um, takes care of our contract and uh, agency relationships. And then we have our field team that drives the vehicles. We do have used Salesforce. We created our own internal uh, app-based system to collect all this data, both in the field and then in the office, um, that provides an in-time data point of how many uh, meals we've recovered and how, how much we've recovered and then also distributed. Um, so we don't have a software system other than that. It's human, it's human capital that is uh, set up to create relationships with agency partners so I can call John on the phone and say, hey, this is what's happening. There are app-based app -based platforms that do that connecting for others. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that they aren't important. They are absolutely important. I just think that, you know, a lot of funding is going their way. And some of that funding should come back to food recovery organizations that are actually doing the day-to-day, -day, point to point work. I can be a broker today. I can sit in front of my computer. I can make phone calls and I can refer you all the work. Then I can receive the payment for services rendered. And then I can not share that with you. And I can say that I'm doing that because I have an app based program that's collecting the data to send John a report that indicates what they get written off on their taxes. So, you know, all of that's necessary. We don't do that. We we provide that service to service. And I'm wondering because there have been a lot of recycling efforts over the years that have tried to involve networks where people can say, I've got excess, you know, pieces of linear feet of wood. I've yeah. got I've got a handful of toilets. Does somebody need yeah. them? And it breaks yeah. down because there's just too much logistics involved. But you yes. you've got a monster monstrous amount of logistics that you're dealing with and yep. i and i it, it's hard for me to imagine somebody sitting in a room and figuring it all out or you sitting being on the phone all day saying you know john i got another you know fifty thousand pieces of this or that and it is how do you get it all done we all believe 
in this space that there's a better place for food than in the ground. And what I've found in working in this space and what has kept me in this space is that we all have like-minded intention and that's to keep the food out of the ground. And we get like-minded people together who want to find the solution. People that are involved in food recovery are like, I call it granola. We're like hippies with short hair. Like we all want to, <laughs> like, like it's, 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 we don't want the food to go to waste. And we want it to go to somebody who needs it or can use it. And it's neat. Like we, I have network partners that I could call right now and say, hey, we have X. Do you want it? No, I can't use it. However, I'll call Fred or I'll call John. And it's this, this wonderful organic environment that takes on a life of itself. Back to your observation, you're right. It takes a lot of time. However, if you have the right relationships and there's trust involved in those relationships, I have found that that's the most useful way to go about this. Food recovery, you have to stay agile. You, you can't, like that's the unique thing. It's so easy to convince yourself that you need to have a rigid or solid system. Not in food recovery. You have to pivot. You have to be agile. And, and in many cases, um, that's the only way to be successful in my experience. Yeah. I've always thought I was miscast in this thing, in this business as a lawyer. I, I always thought engineers would have a thrilling career in recycling and, because it's all, all these things are engineering things. So yeah. I'm wondering in, in your, in your mission to keep things out of the ground, what innovative things have you done that you're most proud of to keep things out of the ground? Our vehicle design. Yeah. The point to point, the point to point way that we can pick it up, deliver it in the same day. Um, we created a vehicle that has battery operated refrigeration that we recharge each evening and it has a 12 to 18 hour use life for the all day using that refrigerated vehicle. Um, I think getting the team may not be what would be considered something you put out on social media. Well, yeah, it would. The team loves what they do. You can't just fake because you're basically going and picking up something that would otherwise go into the landfill. You're picking it up and you're providing it to the community. And the model that we have, I think, is the best. Right? It looks like a catering truck. It takes away the stigma. It's got this beautiful um, banner on the outside. It, it looks, it just, it. We've we've helped participant guests to feel more comfortable that they can come up to the environment, and the team helps them to do that. Um, so, how, how, much, how much reluctance is there out there these days for that? Is well, there it... used to be a lot. Yeah, there used to be a lot more. Not as much as there used to be, is, is my answer to that question. And it all goes back to how you approach that conversation. If you approach that conversation um, and you're not mindful and sensitive to the fact that this could be uncomfortable for somebody to be up at your truck, mm -hmm. um, you're not going to find success. I have found in my experience at that distribution site as a person in the truck providing you with meals, that word of mouth communicates to everybody that you're kind yeah and they tell a friend who tells a friend who tells a friend so there's distribution type sites at times that i was involved in for 80 people long for an hour and a half right um so to answer your question i think it goes back to how you approach it in a dignified way do you walk the talk do you treat the reputation that you create with the community the community talks to each other um, and and I think we found a way to make sure that we honor the, the the need to provide a dignified way to provide support that someone did. They don't want to be in our line. They don't want to have to show up. They really don't. However, why are we going to beat them over the head and make them feel uh, shame? Why are we going to put them in a circumstance that they are embarrassed? So we work at trying to make sure that that's not their experience. Well, let's go back to the community kitchen. There, that must be a place of innovation. Tell, tell me about some of the innovative things that are done in the kitchen. 
Yeah, we have. That's cool. We we bought a uh, Oliver meal packaging. We have two of them machine. And what this does is during the pandemic period, we had to figure out a way because we were essential workers. We never sheltered in place. We were out in the community. So we had to figure out a way to do the six foot of clearance and keep things packaged in a safe way and then also food safe way, right? What this, this machine does is it, it two compartment, three compartment containers, heat sealed top with a label on top of reheat instructions. And it's a conveyor belt system that we can we can put food in those particular uh, packages and then send it through and then send it out to, to the communities that we serve. Those go out hot or cold, frozen. They can be reheated in a microwave oven, a conventional oven, um, or as I said, frozen and then reheated. So that I think is innovative. Um, the equipment that we're using, I, my favorite piece of equipment we purchased with this iteration of our kitchen is a blast chiller. Um, it may not mean anything to anyone else on this call, but to me, it's like the savior for food safety when it relates to getting large amounts of, let's say you get a large amount of protein that you can cook off and then blast chill. It, it reduces the amount of time it takes to cool items to temperature so that they can be stored more quickly than going through the cooling process that sometimes you have to use ice wands for. So that's cool. The biodigester, of course, is something that adds value to the kitchen because all of the food scraps become then soil. Um, you know, we're always looking at creative ways to reduce, you know, the work for our team. I've purchased different types of chopping machines to reduce the back problems with the team that they're having. Um, We've, we've been fortunate that through time and funding, we've been able to provide support to our culinary staff. Um, and uh, so, you know, from refrigeration, the two containers that I talked about that we used to store some of those meals to a $5.5 million kitchen that we just built uh, that will provide us the opportunity uh, to be able to create 10,000 to 15,000 meals a day. Um, we work alongside partners to determine more uh, creative solutions to take less and make more. Um, so long-winded answer to your question. I hope that it touched upon an answer that you were looking for. Well, I was also, I mean, you, you've touched on a lot of cool things that have to do with the industrial scale safe processing of the food. I was yes. sort of, because I'm I'm a cook, not a chef, I was wondering more about the cooking innovation. I'm thinking you have unpredictable amount, amounts of different recoverable ingredients. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're going you're gonna to try to make them into meals. I don't know if it's soups and stews or other things. And I'm wondering, no, they're, you know, they're really if, wonderful meals. If, if Gordon Ramsay came into the kitchen, would he be happy? I think so. And if you know him, invite him, <laughs> give him my name. Give him my name and email address. I'd be happy to have him come because sure. that's very, it's a very good point. We created systems that use specific equipment that in fact, like, I don't know if you're familiar with a tilt skillet. It's this massive piece of equipment that's like a saute pan at home mm -hmm. on steroids mm -hmm. <laughs> that we can use to cook off protein to steam pasta or to steam rice, or to saute vegetables. So because we're making these bulk meals, we need bulk ways of creating the ingredient items and cooking them off. We have 30-day rotating menus that we take and only rotate out the protein and then figure out what the flavor profile looks like if you're cooking a chicken or, or a beef, or it's a vegetarian meal, right? So innovative, ways of approaching how you create a, a vegetarian meal, freeze it, reheat it, and it's not mush, right? So yeah, our cooking process at that scale has had to be refined and refined. There was a time when we were freezing vegetarian meals when we first started with this particular partner that I would freeze them in my freezer at home for 30 days and then try them, and then yeah. 60 days and then try them. And then 90 days and then try them. 
And then we would adjust our, our, because we didn't have the funds to go out and do what a larger organization does, we did a lot of the scientific method before it went out to our community partners, right? So, you know, so we've innovated on the cheap, right? And we've, we've really, I believe that our team, like I've got a binder of meals, like these are menus that we're going to start into Asian fusion and Latinx meals, right? That are a protein, traditional protein and a vegetarian item. And so we're always thinking about ways that we can stay ahead, not only from a perspective of food safety and process, but we also have a shared cost program where we have agency partners that help, you know, we provide meals to them they reduce the cost of their meal programs by receiving them from us. And then we share the cost. And some of the, the cost that uh, they give to us is over our cost and we can put that back into our organization and use that to support our operation, right? So another innovative way. And we've got a partner that last year saved, he told me about $500,000 by having us as a partner comparative to the previous year's budget. So that to me is important. I think that, you know, we'll continue as an agency to continue to expand on our food recovery. We'll continue to provide our community meals and we'll continue to build on our program services options that we share cost with other vendors. And that that helps us to not have to depend so much on government funding. The, the scale of this is sort of astounding. Um, I want to come back to the money in just a second, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm stuck in the kitchen. And I'm going back to your the point you were making about dignity. I would assume that part of that is these meals that you're providing, to some extent, have to be flavorful. They have yeah. to be they have to be plated in an attractive manner, just like you would in, in a restaurant. How, That's how, right. do, how do you do that on an industrial scale? And do you? Well, it's a, yeah, well, I think the the all of our packaging equipment that I was talking to about, you know, if you've if you've had a frozen Amy's meal in the grocery store, that's what it looks like, mm -hmm. right? It's really neat. So, if that's the meal serving that we provide to our participant guests, wonderful. In our bulk meals, we we provide bulk trays of meals. There are thirty meals in each one where we provide a protein and veggie starch the agency partners that portion their meals themselves. So yes, flavor profile is extremely important in both concepts, right? As it relates to the recovered activity, the recovered meals that we receive, they've already been prepared in the kitchens that we've received them from. So the flavor profile is already set. So as long as we handle those food items appropriately, in a food safety perspective, the end user gets a wonderful meal that was prepared in a in a kitchen by sometimes five star chefs. So, you know, we have a great, I believe, system in place to make sure that when somebody shows up at our serving site, they're not eating what they may think may not be flavorful. We have to also we we craft our meals so that a diabetic can eat them. We craft our meals so seniors eat them you know we look at that so yeah you're, you're right you you can remove salt add another ingredient and make it taste like salt you can do that there's just the complexity there and that's what we do percentage wise about how many of your the meals that you send out are prepared in your kitchen as opposed to prepared somewhere else half, half. i would say half to Maybe fifty-five percent we prepare. The others are are recovered. Um, I would say you could add that to sixty with the items that we receive through donation that we we put back into meals that we could create meals. So let's take it up to sixty percent. Forty percent of that is 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 directly from whom we've received it from straight out to the community. How what what's your What's your residue at the end of the day? How much stuff did actually that you receive goes into the ground? Do you think nothing in the ground? 
Okay. Nothing in the ground. Because you because you composted. That's correct. Okay. We and we also have a biodigester. Yeah. On site in our office. So it turns into that nutrient rich soil I was talking about. Um, you know, you'd be shocked that not a lot of it goes into that biodigester. Um starches will make it in that, right? Because if you're at a serving site and everybody can make rice or pasta. And if you have excess of that and you don't have the entree item, that may go into the biodigester. So, you know, it and, and because it's food recovery, mm -hmm. it's never same every day. <laughs> it, food recovery is one day it's feast, the next day it may be famine. Sometimes we have to supplement with meals that we provide in our kitchen to support the routes that we have from our food recovery activity, right? Depends on the donor and what we receive, right? So good question. And every day is different, John, but it's less than I think you'd think. Do you, do you, what, what happens with, with your residue, the, the, the stuff that goes in the digester? Do, does any of it go to animal feed or things like that? No, we take it to our, we have a, an organic garden that we use the, the soil enhancer. We provide it to the city of San Jose. Um, we bag it and, and, and take it to uh, uh, a garden club that's local. Um, we share it with, uh, we have a farmer that we have a relationship with that donates all of our vegetables that we grow in our garden. We provide it to him and his team. He's got a huge piece of land in the Coyote Valley area. Um, so we share it. We don't charge for it. We just give it away. So I've got two more questions, and then I'm gonna. I think I'd like to turn turn it over to the group to see if they have questions of you. I could I could talk to you forever, but um, <laughs> thank if, you. If you could tell me without revealing secrets, what 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 are your funding sources, and what percentage is private as opposed to public? Yeah, good question. I would say I'll answer the, the latter first percentage wise. This last year, um, funding sources uh, for some of the activity that we do have really been reduced because COVID funds have been reduced, right? So local yeah. jurisdictions, I'm going to say make it a 30%, a 70%. 70% has to come from private sources, 30%, you keep your fingers crossed to hope that in fact it's coming, right? Right. Um, we've got great relationships and um, we're presently involved in conversations from the local and state level for funding. So funding yeah. this activity is tough, uh, truly. Um, and, you know, that's why I think there needs to be bigger conversation about sharing the responsibility of that said funding throughout the food recovery space. Do, do the private come mostly from corporate sources or do you have angel donors? Yeah, we have we have corporate so sources and we also have wonderful individual donors okay. that are consistently supporting our effort because of what we do. My last question before I turn it over, what can people on this Zoom do to get involved in food recovery if they're if they're of a mind to, that they're not doing it right now. And how can I get a job with you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. I, you know, I think it goes back to just taking a look at your habits as it relates to what you go to the grocery store to pick up and talk about it with your neighbors and talk about the opportunities for composting, right? Um, I'm not I don't have the capacity to go to everyone's home and, and take the the food that's going into the ground. I don't. I don't have that capacity. If we as a if we just talk about why did we buy this, this, and this that's going into the garbage as a family unit, and then we grow beyond that with friends and we talk about it over a, a cocktail or it goes back to just talking about it. People don't know, I think, as much as people assume they do about food recovery activity. Reach out to a local food recovery organization that may be <clears throat> close to you and find out what they're doing. Um, if you have the funds to write a check, write a check to one of those agencies, tax off, tax write off for you, or volunteer with one of those agency partners and see what they actually do. Um, if you're in the Bay Area and you're in the South Bay, 
Uh, most of our activity is in the Santa Clara and San Mateo County areas. We have a la carte vehicles throughout those two counties. Go on our website. Go check out our serving sites, right? Go. Don't take my word for it. Go out and see if the participant guest gets that experience that I've just described to you. So, John, it's it's more about getting to know the space. And, and when you have the opportunity to talk about food recovery, talk about it in a way that's dignified, not that you're handing off your leftovers or your trash. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I think I think it's important. It, it just goes back to that dignified conversation. So again, I I appreciate the question. And, and it's multi, it's multifaceted. The answer is truly multifaceted. Um, but that's what I would say. That that's how you can help me. Talk about food recovery. Talk about food in insecurity. Don't make it about loaves and fishes. Make it about our human condition. Make it about what's happening with the food that could feed the world going into the ground, turning into methane, killing Mother Earth. Like, let's just be real here. Like, and I know I'm talking and preaching to the choir here. And I don't mean to sound like I'm preaching. However, that's my answer, John. Well, I'm glad we're talking about it tonight. I'm 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 like to talk about it more. Um, does anybody have have questions of David? And I, by that I mean questions and not statements, please. Yep. Doug? Yeah, David, I'm so very impressed with the operation you got going on in terms of scale and magnitude and so forth and so on. But I'm wondering, okay, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that you have a biodigester within your facility, but I'm wondering yeah. about the other uh, food generators that don't have that capacity. They have a food that's gone beyond the, uh, the you know, it's no longer uh, edible. Uh, yeah. Is there any parallel effort to make sure that it doesn't go to landfill, it goes to a compost facility for the excess food that's no longer uh, fit for human consumption? Yeah, we, we talk about that at both NICRA and then also CRRA, and, and then CalRecycle has discussion around that and local jurisdiction involvement and county involvement and state involvement about what's the answer to that. And I can only speak to our our agency and what we do. We still have a huge opportunity there, Doug, that people may not be approaching that in a manner that is in line with reducing that footprint, right? Local jurisdictions are having difficulty figuring out how to separate the food, right? Haulers are talking about how difficult it is to separate the food. How many containers should we use? How should it be processed? Each jurisdiction has their own program, <laughs> right? So yeah, we talk about it, Doug. And, and as a group in food recovery, I've, I was on, I've been on three different calls today talking to groups that do similar work that we do. And we talk about how do we keep it out of the ground? And, and I think for me, it's about, let's find a solution that we can keep funded <laughs> so that we can continue the work so it doesn't turn into waste. Um, but to answer your question, Doug, I think there's still a lot of opportunity there. I think they're still trying to figure out how to do that appropriately. Um, and as, as we, I think, continue to beat that drum about the need for these things, you of all people know how difficult it is to get policy passed and and people to come to the table and be champions for the cause um it's going to take time and we still have a, a long way to go uh before we come to a, a solid solution and you're right we're fortunate we have a bioed we we're, we 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 figured out a way to to fund that digester and not everybody has those resources Mary Lou you have a question you have to unmute Thank you. Um, small question. Uh, when you package uh, meals, basically meals ready to eat, I guess, uh, when you package those yes. meals in your own kitchen yes. uh, that can be reheated, do have you found compostable packaging? Yeah, unfortunately, the packaging that we use, we need to purchase a grinder in order to grind it to put it into our biodigester. And that grinder costs us $85,000. So, and I don't have $85,000 to buy that grinder. So one day I may have that, and then that'll become soil also. So 
we use foil in other instances, or we use reusable containers. So we, and in our food recovery um, model, we ask that we receive items in foil um, so that the foil can be recycled. Um, packaging technology is not so great when it relates to transportation of items. Um, and we've, we've, we've done our best at finding the right packaging while also reducing cost. Um, so we're still working on that. We haven't, you know, it would be wonderful if we could use just reusables. However, it's, it would logistically be difficult for us to do that. But if, if I, if I receive, I come to your truck and I receive a prepared meal, and yep. I go away and eat it, and I'm very grateful. I still have a container. Yep. So is that uh, recyclable? I mean, if it's not compostable, is it recyclable? It is, what, it is, what is, it? It is compostable. Yes. It is. The user, though, needs to do something with that in order for that to be the case, right? So if okay, they... But if they have a local system where they can throw away compostable things, yes. they can throw yes. it in there. That's correct. Okay. Bonnie, yep. did you have a question? Yes, um, I would like to know if I was a food generator like um, Twitter or uh, Salesforce having a big uh, event, how do I get on your redistribution list? And then second part of the question is, are y'all using any kind of app like technology kind of like an uber eats or situation where people can like say hey i have food that i need picked up and redistributed like are y'all thinking about that as well so i'll answer both questions first if you're a, a twitter or um a salesforce um and you reached out to us we would put together an mou agreement that would determine how many days a week that would come to pick up that excess food. Would do a would do a site visit, honestly, because I want to be sure that how you manage the food hmm. will come out to the end user in the way that it needs to to be safe for them to eat. The app based question, we're working on trying to get away from having to use someone else's app, right? We work alongside some of the eight, uh, some partners that we have that have apps that do what you said, a connector, and I'd like to create our own, right? And so we're in the process of creating something that'll work for food recovery organizations that are actually doing the work versus those that are the hub of being the connector. As it relates to DoorDash and, 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 and Grubhub, and the activity that's going alongside those, I don't feel comfortable with the way the food is being managed from a, food, a temperature control perspective. It doesn't mean that when I order from DoorDash that I know what Sally or Fred did with that food before it got to me. All I know is if it tastes good and it's from the restaurant I ordered, and whether or not it looks like it's in good shape, right? I'm hopeful that it didn't fit in it, <laughs> okay? I'm hopeful that they handled it appropriately, right? I just have found in pilots that I've been involved in that use that model, there's still a lot of bumps. And I think the answer for me is to develop our own system so that we can connect. And we're working on ideas now. So thank you for your question. I hope I answered all of them. Dan, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, back when I was in grad school, um, I was a sociologist, and I still am. Um, and one of the things that I was really particularly interested in was labor economics, but not in the sense of unions and all that stuff, more about what does it cost for labor and what is the balance between labor and capital when you have a labor intensive business, you're a labor intensive business. Yes, what I'd like to know is with your 21 staff, uh, first of all, what would be the gross pay for, say, per month or, or per year uh, so as we, a percentage of income? Yeah, so we, great question. 
Generally speaking, we start people off at a very good rate that's way above minimum wage. We pay for their insurance benefits as well. Um, they have all the paid holidays the government has, and we provide sick time and 401k and all the things that would, would come with working for a for-profit agency. The funds that we receive from donors, 92% of those funds go back to programs. Only 8% of our funds go to paying for those programs being implemented from an executive level uh, area. Um, yes, you're right, human capital, it's, it's expensive. Um, however, we're also lean um, and we, we continue to remain lean um, in order to keep costs at a minimum. Um, I'd love to be able to pay more. I, I truly would. However, we also have to continue the work and continue to be able to sustain paying for that work. So, um, so what would be your annual payroll then? You mean, well, you're looking at a, we only have a budget of $4.5 million. Okay. That's what, right. So yeah. that budget is for everything. That's all activity that that happens pays for everything got it um so so you know i'd love to have a 10 million dollar budget um because <laughs> that would mean that i had more more funds to fund the activity that we do so you know it's and i want to look at sustainable ways to fund as well i'd love to have a jar of some type of a sauce item on the shelf at whole foods or another grocer that has our label on it like a, a newman's own because I want to get away from funding from uh, a government source and get closer to being able to work at 70% of our revenue comes from our activity. That's right. right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So that's, that's where we're headed. We're just not what, there yet. That's what urban or does actually. We're at about 70% of total income goes to payroll. Yeah. And, and hugely, you know, we, it's hugely important to pay your, Pay your people well, and I'm really glad to hear that they're making more than the minimum wage. Ours do too. Yes, I think I, it's. I wonder very how important. much of a big, how what kind of a phenomenon this is in the whole industry. I think a lot of people think it's just a matter of heart and uh, all that, but it's not. It's really a lot right. of people making a living for crying out yes. loud. That's right, and we have individuals on our our team that have been here for 14 years. So hey. you're right. You're absolutely right. And I think that's the mis the misperception, I'll call it. That because you're in this space that you're just gonna show up and do things for free. That's not reality. No. We pay people to do a job, and it just so happens that that job is mission driven and they love what they do. That and is like you must you must sleep well at night. <laughs> With that, absolutely. I'm proud of that. I am I am absolutely proud of the fact that people do this job because they want to. I, to the contrary, I sometimes have to tell them, hey, it's it's five o'clock on Friday. That's gonna be there on Monday. Go home. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> right? So it, it it the heart that is it, it we I am so grateful. The team's heart is bigger than the world. And, well, you're a wonderful person, man. I, I, that's all I can say. The fact that you tear up and you're a man and you admit it, holy cow, that is a manly, manly thing to do. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I accept that and say thank you. you I, I, don't so mean, I only want this to end, but I want to ask if anybody else has any questions of David. Doug? See, yeah, this, yeah, I'm thinking about these... Uh, compostable food containers, you know, two or three compartments. How, yeah. how do you go about avoiding uh, those that are have a plastic or P, uh, PFA uh, liner? How, how do you avoid We don't. That? We don't. We can't. There isn't a packaging that we found that'll work the way that that packaging will with the machine that we own. So we're, we're actively pounding down that with the manufacturer of the packaging because if that liner isn't in the container, it can be pulled out. It's it's labor intensive. But if that liner isn't in the container, the container doesn't hold its, it just doesn't hold liquid and it deteriorates. 
it won't be frozen and, and able to be reheated. So I don't want to use plastic, right, at all. Um, I'd rather use foil. However, the machines that we need to use to package the meals have not created that. And honestly, we purchased the, the packaging from the company that made the machine, so it's proprietary, <laughs> right? So to answer your question, it's still something that the industry is still working on, Doug. Um, and I look forward to the solution. And I hope that it's not so expensive to use that it outprices what we can provide to our, 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 our guests. But we tear that out when we put those meal items into the biodigest. It's like a liner, to your point, that has to be pulled out in order to put it into the biodigester. Um, so, yeah, it's still a problem. The liner that goes over the top of sealing the container, still a problem. But let me ask about those uh, world-centric uh, food containers. Are those yeah. truly compostable, or do they actually have a film or PFA? Uh, depends on, it depends on the packaging that's being used. Um, two compartment, three compartment, one compartment have a different uh, way of produce, being produced. So it depends. It depends on the packaging that we're using. I wish I could say to you, Doug, that we figured that out because I agree with you. I wish we could. It, the, the technology just isn't there yet. Dan, did you have one more question before we? Yeah, I, didn't, it, I just wanted to let you know that Clover Dairy and everyone else, Clover Dairy just in the last few months, as far as I know, um, has milk now in gable top containers with a liner that is compostable. Right on. Yeah. Right on. We have some in our compost pile right now, and we're doing tests on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I look forward to the day that that becomes, uh, well, it's going to. It has to. Well, it doesn't it leak. To. Right. And, and, and I, I, I look forward to the day that we embrace that. Not you, we, not me, we, but we yeah. as a, Everybody. a we embrace that uh, yeah, because absolutely. then costs will be reduced because of that, you know. <laughs> the market gets created and then the marketing gurus decide that this is a good product to sell and then people buy it, right? Um, I hope that we um, can influence those who help those things to occur to make that happen more quickly because it's taken too darn long. Well, David, thank you so much for spending so much time with, with me tonight and us. Um, it's an inspiring company, an inspiring story, inspiringly told. And I'm sending you my resume tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but, but I even, appreciate even it. If I, even if, they, if I take the job, we're still going to have this wax show next month. We do it on the <laughs> second Tuesday of every month. We start at 5 o'clock with cocktails, 5.30 for the show. Next month, we're going to talk, kind of following on this session tonight, we're going to talk about how to teach children about zero waste and recycling. And we're going to call it "Teach Your Children Well." We're going to have we're going to feature Laura Anthony in the recycling archives, and hopefully, we'll see you all next month. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you. you.